Our story begins when mankind was on the brink of extinction, along with the evil god Vindrake, who suddenly appeared in the sky, countless monsters wreaked havoc upon the land. The monsters spread across the land to kill every human, but then something appeared that made the monsters explode, and Vindrake growled in anger. The last hope of mankind arrived, they were the strongest mages of mankind, standing against the evil god. The monsters rushed to attack the mages, and our protagonist, who was at the front, ordered his comrades to prepare their magic spells. He then ordered them to fire at the monsters, which they did. He called out to the evil god and shouted to him that his end was there. He then activated his compound chanting, combining all six magic attributes to fire simultaneously. He attacked Vindrake with his elemental burst skill. The other mages shouted to others to support our protagonist, Setsuna, which they did, launching their attack on Vindrake too. The man smiled, thinking that it was working, and they all waited for the smoke to disappear. However, Vindrake came out of the smoke completely unharmed and didn't move an inch. The mages couldn't believe it. The man gathered his magic power in his hand, shouting that they needed to hit Vindrake harder. The other mages threw another attack at Vindrake, but he shouted to them to wait because they needed to observe. He saw his comrade's magic power heading directly toward Vindrake, but then the attacks disappeared before they could hit. Shocked to see that their magic was dispelled, Vindrake teasingly asked them if this was the best they could do, calling them squirming insects who rot in his garden and describing them as foolish and miserable creatures. The lady was horrified when they realized that their magic was not working against Vindrake. The man shouted at him to give them his orders. He cursed in panic, thinking that there must still be something they could do, but suddenly, the man behind was attacked and killed instantly. They then noticed that they were surrounded by a swarm of different monsters. The lady with Cain stutteringly told him that she was running out of mana. Suddenly, the man and the lady were grabbed by the monsters while begging him to save them. Another lady, who was trying to fight, was eaten by a monster frog, leaving him stunned in horror. He then attacked the monsters with all his magic power, shouting at them to stop, but then Vindrake appeared behind him and attacked him. A moment later, all of his companions were dead, and he was severely injured. He tried his best to sit down and was stunned in horror when he saw their place burned down, all the humans dead, and the monsters enjoying their feast on humans. He clenched his fist, asking if this was mankind's defeat. Vindrake replied that it was a futile struggle, making him think that it was not yet their defeat. He cast a spell and launched his fist at Vindrake, punching him. But Vindrake managed to block his punch with his arms. Still, Vindrake screamed in pain and was injured by his attack. Shocked that his attack worked, he wondered how such low-level magic could leave some damage on Vindrake. He then understood that he could defeat the evil god with just that. But he noticed he only realized this in his current condition. Vindrake lifted his hand to attack him and told him that this was as far as he would go. But then the pendant on his necklace moved and released a bright light. He knew that it was what he had received from the headmaster and remembered asking the headmaster if the necklace was the necklace of rebirth, to which the headmaster replied yes and explained that the necklace of rebirth holds the power of the spirit of time, allowing him to redo his past regrets only once. He told the headmaster that he had never had one regret before and asked him if he thought it would be a waste on him. The headmaster laughed at his words and told him that he expected it from the top graduate of his magic academy, but he seriously told him that he was sure he would need it in the future. He grabbed his pendant, thinking about his regret and shouted that his regret was that he didn't choose to pick that magic at that time. He then shouted to Vindrake that he would definitely win against him this time, and then he was back at the school. He opened his eyes, and a man behind him hit his back, telling him not to space out too much because it was his turn next. He looked back and saw that it was Leo. He remembered that Leo was supposed to go missing before the evil god appeared. He then looked around, wondering if that building was the Magic Academy, and realized that he had really gone back 10 years. He then swore that he would not let their defeat happen again and that he would ensure victory against the evil god. Leo then tells him that he had been saying it was his turn and reminds him that they are at a ceremony of blessings, prompting him to apologize and walk to the stage. He heads directly to the man. One of the students whisperingly asks if he is the greatest genius in the history of the academy, and a lady replies that she heard Setsuna has the magic affinity for every magic path. The man opened the magic book, and he covered his face when the pages flew out of the book, knowing that there were different paths in magic. To activate magic, a different technique is required, which is why they have to choose a magic path, making learning different magic from different paths difficult. It was akin to not being able to believe in two gods at the same time. The man then calls his name and orders him to choose the magic path he desires. He then pointed to one of the symbols, asking him if he was sure that his choice would be it. He knew that it was a long-range magic symbol and normally, it was the right choice because elements are made from mana and then aimed at their enemy. With the low risk of being attacked with long-range, long-range attacks are normally enough to defeat their enemy. He remembers becoming the strongest mage in the world with long-range magic, but it was useless against the evil god. 
He then turned away from the long-range symbols and walked to the symbol on the side. He then stopped at the sharp symbol, making the man shocked and the students whisper in disbelief. Leo asked him what he was doing when he said that morning he would pick long-range magic, yet he picked close combat magic above everything else and asked him if he was aware that it was considered the worst of the worst. The man explained to him that the close combat magic path mainly focuses on body enhancement, and he can only attack the enemy that is close to him. Also, that magic path is already abandoned, and it was basically the same as going into a battle filled with bows and arrows with only a stone axe. The man then asked him if he was just going to throw away his future, but he didn't reply because he already knew about it and it was pretty much hopeless as a mage with that magic path. But against the evil god Vindrake, it was the only choice to defeat him. To achieve it, he had to do it. The man and the student stared at him in horror, and the headmaster seriously looked at him, but he still reached for the close combat symbol and chose it. The symbol was marked on the back of his hand while he thought that he would choose it and beat the crap out of the evil god. When he saw that the symbol was successfully marked on the back of his hand, he confidently smiled, but the students were horrified, witnessing him choose the close combat path. The man closed the magic book, and Cyrus Arclight, the head of the long-range magic department, shakingly told him that he had intended to entrust him with all his knowledge if he had chosen long-range magic. Cyrus then shouted at him that he would have become the strongest mage and that glory was promised even to him, his mentor. But he just turned around, knowing that glory would be meaningless in ten years. He knows that in ten years, humanity will face defeat, and in five years, the evil god will appear. He gets off the stage, looking at his symbol, aware that he has knowledge from the first time but hardly any practical experience with close combat magic. He also wonders how he will develop that magic before the evil god's appearance, unaware that Cyrus was fuming with anger. A moment later, the announcer tells the second-year students who have completed the rite of acquisition to proceed to their respective field classrooms. He looked around, wondering where the classroom for close combat magic was and noticed that Leo wasn't there. He then asks a man if he could show him the way to the close combat room. But the man is just shocked to see him and rushes away with a lady, making excuses not to talk to him. He looks around and sees the students whispering about him. He then heard some of the students say it was over for him too and that he'll learn his lesson for choosing such a field to stand out. He realizes that just by choosing close combat, the treatment towards him is quite different from last time. However, he decides to ignore them and thinks that he'll have to find his room himself. He then remembered that there should be a map of the entire campus in the courtyard, so he headed to the courtyard. But while he was walking, he heard someone shouting fireball. Shocked and wondering if there was a fight in a place like this, he then saw a lady being pushed and shouting at the men to give it back because it was a precious brooch her mother had bought for her. One of the men raised the brooch, asking her if it was a magical tool for storing mana. Another man then said it was too fine a high-class item for commoners like her, but they'd make good use of it. Setsuna knew that the one being bullied was from the close combat department, and the three aggressors were from the long-range department. The man released his fire, suggesting to the lady that she should take the brooch back by force if she wanted it, using her weakest close combat magic, and threw fireballs at her. She tried her best to dodge the fireballs, and Setsuna noticed that she used the basics of close combat magic, a physical boost that enhances physical abilities. However, he also knew that even if she managed to avoid some magic, the reach was too different. She then conjured something with her power, shouting at the bullies that the brooch was something her mother had saved money for years to buy for her, and she'd never hand it over to the likes of them. She formed a blade, and he recognized it as close combat magic, the mana blade. The fire mage laughingly told her it was hopeless and threw fireballs at her again, taunting her about whether that dagger would reach him. She was hit by one of the fireballs, throwing her to the ground. The man teasingly told her she was pathetic and that no matter what she did, it wouldn't reach them, the long-range mages. The fire mage then threw another fireball at her, shouting that she would probably spend her whole life never getting anything like it. Stunned in fear as the fireballs neared her, Setsuna used his magic power and dashed to the men at speed. She saw him reaching for her, and fortunately, he grabbed her away in time to avoid the fireballs, leaving the bullies stunned in horror and shock. He asked her if she knew where the close combat magic department was, telling her that he wanted someone to guide him there, making the lady look at him confused. One of the bullies shouted, asking if he was Setsuna Cromwell, and they noticed he had chosen close combat magic based on the symbol on the back of his hand. The fire mage asked his friends if they were serious and shouted that it was perfect. He released a fireball in his hand, telling his friend that if Setsuna was in close combat, they could beat him up as much as they wanted. Setsuna walked towards them, telling them that close combat magic is indeed weak, but it depends on how they use it. While observing, he noticed there was room for improvement. He then told them that the quality of the magic field doesn't necessarily determine the outcome of a battle. The lady shouted at him to stop, warning that those men were seniors and he could get hurt, 
but the fire mage threw fireballs at him and shouted to the lady that it was too late. Setsuna concentrated the magic on his legs using a physical boost specifically for leg strength and dodged every fireball with ease. He smiled, realizing that with his current speed, he could also dodge magic, and thought that if he could move this freely, he wanted to try more. While avoiding the fireballs, he taunted the mage, noting that he had only been shooting fireballs and asked if he couldn't use any other elements. The mage was flustered and shouted at him to shut up, puzzled by Setsuna's movements and realizing he couldn't aim properly. The mage, now furious, gathered a huge fireball in his hands and shouted that he wasn't joking around. However, when he threw it towards Setsuna, Setsuna simply created a mana blade and slashed at the huge fireball, slicing it into two. The mage couldn't believe that his fireball had been sliced, and the lady asked Setsuna in shock if such a thing was possible, to which he replied that it was a matter of magic against magic, so the one with higher magic proficiency wins. Setsuna knew that the reason he, who didn't possess particularly high magical power, became the strongest in the world was due to precise control of magical power. He looked at his mana blade, thinking it seemed more useful than he initially thought, and if he combined its power with speed, it would be even more effective. The mage, now enraged, shouted that in that case, he'd use an extra large one. However, the mage's friends warned that it was dangerous and that if they went too far, the instructors would intervene. But the mage shouted at his friends to shut up and began to cast a spell. As the mage looked up while casting, he saw Setsuna running closer at high speed, causing him to panic but continue casting. However, Setsuna appeared in front of him faster than his incantation could be completed. Setsuna activated his mana fist and punched the mage in the stomach. The man collapsed, and the other bullies, along with the lady, were left open-mouthed in shock as he fell to the ground. Setsuna clenched his fist, confident that as long as it was within his range, he could fight effectively, even with close combat magic. One of the bullies sweated in fear, realizing that although close combat magic was supposed to be the weakest, Setsuna's mere use of it demonstrated considerable power. He extended his hand towards the men, asking them if they had forgotten something. The bully hastily handed over the brooch, thinking that it was wise to obey Setsuna for now. The two men then helped their fallen friend and walked away. Turning to the lady, he said he had retrieved her brooch and handed it back to her, inquiring if he was correct in thinking it was important to her. She relaxed and thanked him gratefully, then clipped the brooch back into her pocket. She mentioned she hadn't introduced herself and extended her hand, introducing herself as Layla Rosewell. As he was about to shake her hand, she quickly grabbed his and shook it excitedly, saying she knew who he was due to his famed affinity for all magic paths, and asked why someone like him would choose close combat magic. He wanted to say it was to defeat the evil god, but he guessed no one would believe him. So, he instead asked if she could show him the way to the close combat magic department, realizing from her reaction that the orientation had already started and saying they should hurry. They followed the silent path, noting the department's building was located at the edge of the campus, underscoring the unpopularity of close combat magic. She told him he had to teach her how to make that mana blade from earlier, and he replied that it was nothing special, as it all depended on the control of mana. He realized that close combat magic could be used in many ways depending on the circumstances, and if he could master it, he should be able to counter the evil gods dispel magic. He then recalled the day he met with the headmaster. The headmaster had removed his gloves and placed them on the table, revealing that he possessed symbols of two different magic paths, which shocked Setsuna. He was stunned, knowing that normally, they could only take one path, and noticed that summoning magic was on the headmaster's right hand. But he had never seen a seal on the headmaster's left hand before. He asked the headmaster what the seal in his left hand was, but the headmaster told him that he would tell him when the time came and, just because it was him, he would entrust him with the secret of that second magic path. However, in the end, the headmaster never taught him that magic, and after the emergence of the evil god, the headmaster was assassinated. He had also sensed the danger posed by the headmaster's second magic path, so he swore that he'd definitely learn it and change the fate of destruction. He was brought back to his senses when Layla pointed to the old building in front of them and told him that it was over there. They rushed to the building while he was busy thinking about the problem of how he was now and how he got the headmaster's recognition. As they got closer to the door, they saw the professor waiting for them. The professor was irritated and told him that it was nice of him to be late with a woman. Layla tried to tell the professor that there was a reason for it but the professor shouted at her that he didn't care about her excuses. The professor then told him that no matter how good his achievements were, in that place, he was worthless, and now that he was in the department of close combat magic, he was already trash. He grabbed the professor's hand away from him while telling him that he had been rude the whole time and asked the professor if he was correct in assuming he was the professor of that department and if he had any pride in the close combat magic that he was teaching. 
the professor was furious upon hearing his words and shouted, asking him how he dared to act like that against his professor. But he calmly replied to the professor that there are still undiscovered possibilities in close combat magic, and that is what he believes. The professor fumed with anger and thought that it looked like he needed to break the high nose of Setsuna. The professor then turned around and told him that if he was going to say that much, he should show him instead, while pointing to the students busy trying to break stones. One of the students raised his mana blade and hit the stone in front of him with all his might, but the student cursed when he saw that he couldn't even make a crack. He asked the professor what the test was, and the professor explained that it was the first test needed to determine their rank in the class. There was a crystal embedded in that black steel rock, and all he needed to do was to extract it as quickly as possible. The professor also mentioned that those who fail would be punished. He then shouted to the students that it had already been an hour, yet none of them had managed to break it. The students replied that, easy as he might say, the stone was really hard, and they questioned how they were supposed to break it with the magic they had learned so far. One of the students loudly speculated that the professor was frustrated because he hadn't been chosen for promotion, prompting his friend to whisper a warning to lower his voice since the professor could still hear him. The professor, noticing a free rock on the side, challenged him to demonstrate the possibilities of close combat magic, but he would only have 10 minutes. Layla protested to the professor that breaking the black steel rock in just 10 minutes was impossible, questioning if he hadn't noticed that this rock was larger than the others. The professor, however, simply showed a timer and informed him that while they were arguing, he now had only 9 minutes left. He gently pushed Layla backward and touched the stone, examining it for a moment. The professor teasingly asked him why he was speechless, suggesting that if he bowed down and apologized, he might be given additional time. He responded with a firm no, asserting that 10 seconds was more than enough. This statement irritated the professor, who asked him to repeat what he said. Layla shouted wordly that he was being reckless. The professor, thinking them foolish, noted that the black steel rock was not only large but also had a high density, and even he could only break it after 30 minutes. The professor then mockingly shouted that he wouldn't have a second chance, and since he said 10 seconds, he should do it in 10 seconds. He calmly agreed and assured the professor that he would show him, while creating his mana blade. He stared at the stone, knowing that to get acknowledged by the headmaster, he had to be the best in the department at the very least. Then, grasping his mana blade, he thrust it at the stone in front of him, thinking that he couldn't let trivial things like this hinder his goal. The tip of his blade hit the center of the stone but it didn't break, making the professor shout that he was all talk after all and question what kind of punishment awaits him for disobeying his professor. Suddenly, when he pulled the tip of his blade away, the stone cracked and exploded into pieces, leaving the professor confused. He then handed the crystal to the professor, stating that it took 10 seconds, which made the professor shout in shock. Layla, along with the other students, couldn't believe he had actually done it. The students, in shock, questioned if he was stronger than their professor. Hearing this, the professor shouted, refusing to admit such a thing, claiming it was cheating. He pointed at Satsuna, arguing that the rock was so hard it wouldn't shatter even in 10 minutes, so breaking it in 10 seconds clearly indicated cheating. However, Setsuna simply asked the professor what he meant by 10 minutes for a rock like that and suggested that perhaps it was time for him to resign and start over as a student. The professor, shouting in anger, called him a brat, but then someone appeared behind him and called the professor by his name, Zakari. The man then grabbed Zakari's bald head, inquiring if he was bullying students again. Zakari, stuttering, addressed the man as head professor Lionel. Lionel, with a yawn, mentioned they were interrupting his nap and told Zakari that Setsuna hadn't cheated at all because he read the flow of mana within the rock and aimed for its weakest point. Lionel then questioned Zakari's competence as an instructor for not being able to see through it, making Zakari jump a little in fear. Lionel shouted to get everyone's attention and announced that their professor Zakari was about to demonstrate mana guard. Positioning himself, Lionel assured Zakari that if he had trained regularly, he wouldn't die from it. Zakari, in fear, swung his hands forward, admitting his fault and swearing never to do it again. Nonetheless, Lionel still punched Zakari, who fortunately managed to cover himself with his arm and slammed into the building door. Setsuna, realizing the power needed to break through the mana guard was extraordinary, wondered who Lionel was, knowing he was no ordinary figure. Lionel then walked closer, proudly tapping Setsuna's back, complimenting him for not being bad at all, especially for being in the lower-leveled close combat department, and encouraged him to do his best. Lionel then turned to leave, but Setsuna told him that just because he was a close combatant didn't mean he would lose to other departments. He vowed to use the strength of close combat to his advantage and become the top of his grade. 
Lionel smiled upon hearing Setsuna's declaration, commending his spirit and offering to teach him magic if he ever expressed the interest. As Lionel walked away, he couldn't help but marvel at the thought that someone else shared his unconventional beliefs. He mused that they had already chosen a representative for the exchange match, but now, an unexpected dark horse had emerged. Later, inside the building, Lionel formally introduced himself to the students and welcomed them to the close combat department. He reluctantly announced that it was time to select a representative for the upcoming exchange match, a prestigious event where the eight magic departments would compete for honor and prestige through a tournament format. Setsuna, having won the exchange match as the representative of the long-range combat department in his past life, knew he couldn't afford to miss out on this opportunity again. While contemplating, Setsuna noticed fragments of the black steel rock on the ground. Lionel informed him that he wasn't the only one who had passed the test. Before their arrival, someone had extracted the crystal using just his fists. Setsuna's gaze shifted towards a man at the side of the room as he wondered if those fragments could have flown from such a distance. Lionel summoned Drago Ochre to come forward. Drago approached and directly questioned if he was Setsuna Cromwell, challenging why someone with aptitude in other magic paths would choose close combat. Setsuna started to explain his choice, emphasizing the unique applications of close combat magic. But Drago cut him off, loudly demanding he justify his supposedly weak physique. Bulging his muscles, Drago boasted about his family's generation's long dedication to close combat magic and how he himself had spent 17 years honing his body for it. Suddenly, Drago dashed towards Setsuna and launched a punch at his side with considerable force. Remarkably, Setsuna didn't budge, while the sheer force of the punch caused other students to fall to the ground. Drago challenged him to a fight, refusing to let the representative position fall to a mere pretender who treated close combat as a joke. Setsuna recalled hearing Drago's name during the representative match before his regression. Drago was the only notable figure from the lowly regarded close combat department. Agreeing to the challenge, Setsuna told Drago to bring it on. However, Lionel intervened, pleased that they had reached an understanding, and announced that the match would take place in a week. As Drago walked away, he warned Setsuna not to think about escaping during that week and declared that as a close combat mage, he should be prepared to fight to the death. The others speculated about who would win, but one lady doubted Setsuna's chances against Drago, given his lack of physical training. Layla, concerned, asked Setsuna if he genuinely believed he could win to which he surprisingly answered no, leaving her shocked. Setsuna knew that he couldn't outmatch Drago's trained physique in his current state, but he was not without a strategy. Layla followed him, curious about his next move. They soon arrived at a forest, where Layla was astonished to see a giant tree. She questioned the significance of their location, and Setsuna revealed it was his secret training spot, known only to him. He confidently told her that in this place, he would become three times stronger. She told him that it was a massive tree and must be a sacred tree, more than a thousand years old. Suddenly, the tree released a green light, and the light appeared around him too, making him feel it and realize that he was being acknowledged by the tree once again. She asked what the light coming from the tree was, and he replied that it was the blessing of the sacred tree. He explained to her that it was only given to those who have been acknowledged by the sacred tree. With gratitude for that holy mana attribute, he could recover his mana. He also told her that as long as he was there, he had no worries about running out of mana and basically, he could train until he reached his limit. She was amazed, but she knew that Drago was a natural-born close combat mage. She thought that since Setsuna had helped her get her brooch back, it was her turn now to help him and decided to start scouting, leaving him looking at her confused. The next day, in the close combat department's training room, Layla looked around but was shocked to see Drago easily bench pressing the huge barbells, making her wonder what in the world was going on, thinking Drago was the only odd one there. Drago called Lionel and asked him if the black steel rocks were still in the yard. But Lionel just asked him back if he was planning on crushing all of the rocks. Drago walked away and replied that he wouldn't break them, then put the black steel rocks behind him and did his push-ups while telling Lionel that he was only borrowing them. Layla, who was peeking, was horrified and thought that if someone received a punch from Drago, they would die. She then ran away, wondering if Setsuna was really going to be fine. Meanwhile, in the forest, he was sitting and leaning on the sacred tree, busy reading a book of martial arts, when Layla exhaustingly appeared in front of him and asked if this was the time to relax like that. She reported to him that Drago was doing push-ups with five black steel rocks stacked on his back. He told her that he expected it, but it was already given that Drago would do that to train his physique, and told her not to worry because it was also part of his plan. He then rushed to read the martial arts book with his mana. She asked him what he meant, and he replied that a physical boost is basically reinforcement, 
and controlling the nervous system with mana. He explained to her that if they want to boost their legs, they just need to focus on their legs, and if they want to boost their hands, they just need to focus on their hands, so in case they want to boost their memory, they just focus on the head. He then threw the martial arts book aside when he finished it, stood up, and took off his coat while telling her that once they have got the techniques in their head, they just need to put them into practice. As a leaf fell to the tree, he sensed it and swiftly hit it with his leg before it could touch the ground. More leaves fell, and he managed to shatter every single one of them with his mana blade, leaving Layla, who was watching, amazed. She excitedly told him that she had never heard of a method to learn that fast, but he told her that it was still not enough. Suddenly, he felt dizzy and in pain. He then collapsed to the ground, overcome by tiredness. He saw his hand was bruised and severely injured but told her that he was fine and had merely pushed his muscles to the limit with a physical boost. He then focused on boosting his healing, and in just seconds, his severely injured body healed while he told Layla that he could strengthen his body in a short period of time. She told him that he didn't have to push himself like that and there must be another way, but he replied no, stating that he couldn't keep up with Drago with half-baked methods because Drago had been training for years in close combat magic after all. He then told her that in the remaining week, he needed to do the destroy and reconstruct method a thousand more times, leaving her stunned in horror and asking him what he meant by a thousand times when just a single cycle was already that painful. But he just smiled, thinking that it was nothing compared to the training he had undergone, reminding him of that time. Back in the orphanage, Setsuna couldn't use any magic, and every day, he spent his time practicing but failed many times. Even then, he kept on practicing. Even if growth was slow, he was getting better step by step. He then told her that as long as he could get stronger, it was nothing. Then, in days, they both practiced, exercised their bodies, and trained their skills together. She remembered someone said that Satsuna only had talent, then, looking at him pushing up with the black steel rocks on his back, she realized that in reality, Satsuna had been working harder than anyone. The day of the match arrived, with Drago and Satsuna both on the stage. Drago told him he didn't run away, and he replied that he wouldn't run away because, after all, he was the representative for the close combat department. Lionel raised his hand, asking them if they were both ready, and when the tension between them was palpable, Lionel shouted for the match to begin, and Satsuna immediately dashed toward Drago. He swung his hand towards Drago, but Drago blocked his attack. He twisted one of his feet to gain force and kicked Drago with power. Drago blocked it once more but was pushed back due to the force. He noticed that Drago took everything with Mana Guard. He was shocked when Drago appeared in front of him and launched a strong punch toward him. It made a loud explosion sound upon impact, and the force made the students on the bench, who were watching, cover their faces. Layla, worried, called out his name, and they all waited until the smoke cleared but they were surprised to see that he had blocked Drago's punch. The students shouted that they were going overboard and questioned if they were really just getting promoted. He told Drago that he now understands that if he took a direct hit, it'd be the end. Drago then tried to punch him again, but he avoided it. Drago continuously launched punches at him, and he continuously dodged or blocked them. Drago, shouting, asked him what was wrong and why he was only defending but he silently continued to dodge, making Drago stop attacking to tell him that in the end, his body is still weak and that seems to be his limit. Layla thought that even after all the training Satsuna had done, he was still no match for Drago. They both continued to attack, and Lionel, who was watching them, knew that at a quick glance, Setsuna seemed to be pushed back. Drago then raised one of his feet, and he swung his hand forward to block Drago's foot in time, making Drago frustrated. But Lionel knew that Setsuna was perfectly deflecting all the attacks with his mana control. The frustrated Drago didn't stop attacking him, but he just defended himself without counterattacking. Drago furiously told him that the elites always looked down on close combat, but he remained silent. Drago then spoke about him and his father, who were born into a family that excels in close combat, and asked if he knew how much humiliation they have suffered so far. Drago then created a mana blade and swore to him that he would definitely change that fate with his own hands. He also created a mana blade, and they both rushed towards each other to attack. Their blades collided every time, and Drago tried to slash him, but he continuously dodged and avoided his attacks without fighting back. Drago positioned his feet and jumped above him when he just got down. He immediately looked up and leapt away to avoid Drago's attack, which caused the stage to shatter. Drago charged towards him, but he stood his ground, waiting for Drago to attack. He then blocked Drago's blade with his own, holding tightly to prevent Drago from forcing him down. He remembered overhearing students whispering that it was over for him too, and he'd learn his lesson for choosing such a magic path just to stand out. He told Drago that he could understand his words to some extent, but as he knew, he forcefully retracted his blade, causing Drago's blade to lift in the air. Then, positioning his feet forward, he leaped towards Drago to attack, 
questioning if they weren't both aiming higher than this. Drago, stunned by his question, found his armor shattered and his mana blade exploding. But then he simply smiled at the words and laughed as he attempted to punch him, which he avoided. Smiling, he ran to Drago's side and around him then used his physical boost acceleration skill to attack Drago from behind with his mana blade, but Drago managed to block the attacks. While Drago defended himself against the continuous assault, Layla believed that it was working, and Lionel recognized that although Drago's offense and defense were outstanding, Setsuna's mana control and physical prowess were extraordinary, leaving him wondering who would win. Realizing Drago's defense was solid, he needed to create an opening. He jumped back a bit to create distance between them, and Drago did the same. Drago then created another mana blade and swung it towards his head, but fortunately, he tilted his head back just in time to avoid it. Drago swung his blade backward to gain force and then attack him with it. He managed to block it with his blade but was still slightly pushed back by the force. He noticed Drago was using all his mana for that attack, so he immediately leaped backward, avoiding being shattered along with the ground. He noticed he was about to fall off the stage, and Drago, thinking he had finally cornered him, believed he couldn't use his renowned footwork from there. Drago then flexed his muscles and roared confidently, showcasing his steel-like muscles, leaving Layla and the students wondering at the spectacle. Drago dashed towards him with his muscles tensed and launched a punch, but he calmly waited for Drago, and when Drago's punch hit, it merely pierced through him as if he were water. Drago couldn't believe it was just an afterimage. He then appeared above Drago, explaining that if he kept using his mana at the place where he was standing, he would leave an afterimage briefly, surprising Drago. He appeared behind Drago, ready to swing his blade at him, but Drago turned around with his fist ready to counter-attack. He told Drago it was the end, and slashed Drago with a swift slash before Drago could hit him. Layla and the other students were shocked to witness the attack, and Lionel noticed it was aimed for a counter-attack, capitalizing on the fierce assault. Lionel then shouted that the match was over and declared Satsuna Cromwell the winner. Layla cheered, but the other students were in shock. Drago moved his hand, trying his best to stand up. The students couldn't believe that after taking Satsuna's hit, Drago could even stand again. Drago thought this couldn't be happening and knew the final blow from the mana blade was adjusted to not be fatal. Suddenly, Setsuna extended his hand to Drago, but Drago just asked him what he was fighting for. Setsuna silently looked at Drago for a moment and replied that he was fighting to never lose to anyone and to prevent anything from being taken away from him, swearing to become stronger than anyone else. Drago was surprised by his answer and admitted that he understood Setsuna was strong. Drago then accepted his hand while acknowledging he had been completely defeated by Setsuna who truly lived up to his reputation. Setsuna then looked at Drago, considering that Drago's power might greatly assist in the battle against the evil god. Lionel approached them, commenting that Drago was quite the sore loser for facing Setsuna in close combat. Lionel raised his hand and announced that Setsuna had been chosen as the representative of the close combat department. A few days later, Lionel told Setsuna that it was time for the representative to meet face to face for the exchange match, adding that it might sound strange coming from him, but Setsuna should behave himself, to which Setsuna agreed. Entering the room and walking further, he saw female and male student participants gathered. Then, one of the men inquired if a representative from the close combat department was also participating. The man then expressed his impression that Setsuna was coming out willingly to expose his shame. But soon he noticed the emblem on the man's hand, guessing he must be the representative of the enchantment magic department. The man mockingly called him Mr. Lowly Grunt's department's representative to ask if he wasn't aware. He then stepped on Setsuna's foot, telling him that he was his opponent for the first round. The man teasingly asked him if it wasn't true that, in the past hundred years, there hadn't been a single instance of the close combat department winning. He suggested that they, a worthless bunch, should just stay in the corner of the school building and keep doing muscle training until they died. However, the man shouted in pain because Setsuna had stepped back on his foot. Setsuna then remarked that it seemed like they had a unique way of greeting each other in the enchantment magic department, inquiring if it was something of that sort. Setsuna stepped harder on the man's foot, making the man call him a bastard in pain. However, Setsuna calmly told the man that it was irrelevant whether they hadn't won in a hundred years. This year, the close combat department would win. The man pulled his foot away and shouted at Setsuna to stop talking nonsense. Suddenly, someone walked into the room and suggested that while it was fine to be passionate, perhaps they should wait until the match to determine who comes out on top. The students stood up, and Setsuna remembered that what was happening there was just like before his regression, as he looked at the headmaster in front of them. 
They then gathered in front of the headmaster. A pink-haired lady energetically greeted the headmaster, promising to do her best to showcase her capabilities during the inter-school exchange match. Setsuna recognized the lady as Carol from the summoning department and noted that Carol's friendliness hadn't changed a bit. He remembered Carol as the formidable opponent with whom he had engaged in a fierce battle during the exchange match before his regression, emerging victorious back then. However, he knew he still needed to be cautious this time around. The headmaster congratulated them on earning the right to represent their departments, expressing his delight that eight great talents had come together. He also mentioned that they probably already knew from their departments that the inter-school exchange match would be conducted in a one-on-one -on -one tournament format, with opponents determined randomly. The headmaster announced the lineup for the first match of the inter-school exchange. Close Combat Magic, which specializes in hand-to-hand -hand combat, versus Enchantment Magic, known for bestowing mana upon objects and life. The second match would feature Healing Magic, creators of miracles who support their allies, against Long Range Magic, which aims to defeat enemies without allowing them to approach. The third match would pit Formation Magic, which implies various powers within magic arrays, against Summoning Magic, masters of commanding mythical beasts from other worlds. Finally, the fourth match would showcase the uncategorizable special magic against Alchemy Magic, capable of permanently altering substances. He further explained that the inter-school exchange match serves as a practical lesson in understanding the different magical departments. The match was scheduled to be held in 10 days, giving participants the choice to learn new magic or focus on resting until then. The headmaster expressed his anticipation to see all of their fighting spirit, to which they all excitedly agreed. After his announcement, the headmaster walked away and they all bowed in respect, and he understand that this was the only opportunity to directly contact the headmaster. A moment later, as the headmaster was walking through the corridor, he was called upon by a student. Turning around, he recognized the student as the representative of the close combat department. He introduced himself and made a request. He asked if the headmaster could teach him about his magic if he wins. The headmaster, curious, clarified if he specialized in close combat and mentioned that his summoning magic might not be of much use to him. However, he clarified that he was interested in another of the headmaster's magics, leaving the headmaster shocked and seriously inquiring how he knew about it. Sensing the headmaster's strong mana, he was then confronted with an angry question about his knowledge of such a thing. Surprised by the overwhelming mana, he knows the headmaster is clearly wary of him. Yet, he also understands that this second magic is their hope against the evil god. There's no way he can back down. He tells the headmaster that although he cannot reveal the reason, the victory of close combat after 100 years should overturn the world's common sense. He asks the headmaster if he shouldn't hope for that much. The headmaster doesn't respond, but he continues to stare at the headmaster without backing down. The headmaster then asks him if he is scheming something but agrees with him, stating that on the day he wins the championship, he'll teach him about the second magic. He thanks the headmaster, who warns him that it's by no means an easy path. He replies that even if it's hard, he will definitely show him his victory in the competition. The headmaster turns around to leave, commenting on his spirit. A moment later, he is outside, eating his bread, reflecting on his school life after 10 years and finding his free time quite boring. When he bites into the bread, he realizes it's delicious and decides to thank Layla for recommending it. He then realizes there are 10 days remaining until the event and knows he must prepare as best as he can. Suddenly, someone tells him there's no need for that, and a huge fist appears close to his side. Fortunately, he covers his face in time to block it and jumps away, creating distance from the golem. The enchantment man at the side admits he was aiming for a blind spot attack. He questions the enchantment man's behavior, wondering if he infused life into rocks with an enchantment to create a golem. The enchantment man, angered, replies it's a continuation of their last encounter and there's no need to wait for the exchange match. He then uses his magic to gather stones and create more golems behind him, asking how he dared to embarrass him like that. Calmly, he tells the enchantment man that it was the consequence of his own actions. Suddenly, students emerge from the building behind them, and the enchantment man realizes that it would be troublesome if what looked like bullying a close combatant got reported. He then withdraws the life from the golems and walks away, warning him to be more prepared for their match. He acknowledges the enchantment man's considerable skill, as he can provide mana to such a significant amount of matter and control it simultaneously. However, he tells the enchantment man that he shouldn't leave after causing someone to drop their bread. The next day, in the close combat building, 
Lionel announces that the day's topic is preparation for the exchange match. They will analyze the recent battle between Drago and Satsuna. Lionel asks them both if they understand their shortcomings, to which they both reply affirmatively. Lionel instructs Drago to share first, and he admits that he lost control of his mana and emotions. Lionel then turns to him, who confesses that he lacked basic power and was inferior to Drago in terms of sheer strength. Lionel praises them, explaining to everyone that recognizing their weaknesses is the first step toward growth. Lionel also advises that they should start improving immediately in today's match. Layla calls Lionel to ask if that match serves as training for an exchange match, to which Lionel responds affirmatively, commending her question. He explains that their opponent for the first match is Noel from the Enchantment Magic Department. According to Sitsuna, Noel uses multiple golems for both offense and defense. However, since golems possess physical bodies, their basic fighting style is akin to that of close combat magic. Lionel then assigns specific tasks for today's match. He instructs Drago to focus on speed and, acting as multiple golems, to attack from all angles. He orders Setsuna to deflect Drago's attacks and counter, to which Setsuna nods in agreement. A moment later, Drago tells him it won't be like last time, eliciting a response that he is looking forward to it. Drago then charges at him and launches his fist, but he calmly waits for it and tilts his head to the side to dodge. As Drago slides one foot to the right, he anticipates an attack from that direction. However, Drago smiles and surprisingly punches him from the left, which he fortunately blocks with his arms. Realizing his reaction speed was too slow, Lionel praises Drago for balancing speed and power effectively. Drago quickly moved in front of him, launching a punch to the right, which he dodged. He then stepped one foot backward, anticipating Drago's next move, a left hook. However, he was surprised when Drago instead attacked from the right, but he managed to avoid it, realizing Drago's initial moves were a feint. Lionel praised him for his good judgment and instructed him to dodge with a step and counterattack. Spreading his legs while acknowledging Lionel's advice, he dodged Drago's left hook and launched his right fist in return. They continued to practice until both were down on the ground, exhausted. Drago complimented the match, to which Lionel provided them water, noting that their movements were commendable. With a few days' practice, they could handle being surrounded by four to five golems. However, he warned Lionel that no amount of training should lead them to let their guard down. Lionel, smiling, observed his ability to absorb instructions effortlessly, and considered Drago knowledgeable in close combat basics, but Setsuna's sense was indeed exceptional. Days later, the day of the exchange match arrived. The host announced the commencement of the 781st Elmridge Magic Academy exchange match, questioning which of the representatives from the eight magic departments would claim the title of the strongest. The man then inquired which side the audience was betting on, noting the low popularity and bets on Setsuna from the close combat department. However, the fireball man from before expressed his hope for Setsuna to win, having placed bets on him. The students noticed Cyrus with the long-range representative and speculated if the man next to Cyrus was actor from the long-range magic department, thinking actor might face the winner of this match. The host announced that the exchange match's stages would change randomly, revealing that this time it was set in a desert. Noel, smiling, commented on the setting, but he just silently stared back at Noel. The students cheered for Noel, mockingly expressing their pleasure at his facing the underdog department. Layla, irked, shouted back at the students, challenging them to watch closely and reconsider their underdog assumption. He smiled upon seeing Layla argue with the enchantment department students while Lionel attempted to calm her. The host then raised his hand and dramatically signaled the beginning of the first match by bringing it down, shouting for the match to start. Noel took out a piece of black steel rock and teasingly asked him if he knew what it was. He simply replied that it was a black steel rock, to which Noel agreed and threw it onto the sand forcefully, explaining that it was a fragment needed to make a golem by fusing it with the sand. Suddenly, something emerged from beneath the sand, and the piece of black steel rock transformed into a huge golem. Noel informed him that even a blade couldn't leave a scratch on that black steel golem. Then, Noel showed several more black steel rocks in his bag and tossed them all onto the sand, where they too formed into golems. Noel proudly declared that his chances of winning were 1 in 10,000. Layla, worried, inquired about the number of golems, and Noel explained that those golems could be infinitely created from the sands, implying he wouldn't be able to get close to him. A man on the bench arrogantly stated that the result was decided before the fight even started, and others shouted that it would be better for him to surrender. Noel, confidently, told him to speak now if he had anything to say. He responded in a low voice, puzzling Noel, who asked what he said. He then told Noel it was boring and hadn't expected that to be his trump card which made Noel furious, asking him what did he said. Noel ordered his golems to overwhelm him. The golems rushed at him to attack. A loud noise echoed from the stage, but the viewers couldn't see anything due to the sand. 
Noel, laughing, taunted him while the students wondered aloud what was happening, unable to see through the dust cloud. Meanwhile, the golems that rushed to him fall to the ground, and with a multiple swift slash, he dispatched the remaining golems. He informed Noel that he had already mastered the black steel rock, shocking Noel, who knew the golems' resilience. Noel then revived the golems with his enchantment skills, shouting that he could create as many as he wanted. As the golems rushed at him again, he calmly stated that in close quarters combat, close range magic was supreme. Regardless of the number of golems Noel could produce, with their simple moves, they stood no chance against him. He then leapt towards the advancing golems and sliced them into pieces with his mana blade at an astonishing speed. Finally, he launched the tip of his mana blade at the last golem, stabbing its head and causing it to explode into fragments. Noel scrambled to grab more black steel rocks from his bag but was caught off guard when he found himself face to face with Setsuna, who launched a fist at him while declaring the match unfair for him. Noel was struck in the face, sending him tumbling and dragging across the sand. Meanwhile, the viewers, unable to see through the dust cloud, questioned eagerly what was happening inside it. As the dust began to settle, the crowd murmured in disbelief, questioning who was left standing. To their astonishment, it was revealed that he stood victorious, and the host announced that Setsuna Cromwell had won. He smiled, acknowledging his victory in the first battle, while Layla cheered, proud of his accomplishment. The enchantment students watched in horror as the close combat department celebrated a rare victory, speculating on how long it had been since their last win. One student pondered whether continuously creating new golems led to an unsustainable output, causing Noel's downfall, while others expressed anger, insisting that Setsuna's victory was a fluke and that the close combat department had merely gotten lucky. In contrast, Cyrus clenched his teeth in frustration, refusing to accept the defeat as a mere self-destruction. Actor, noticing his instructor's reaction, acknowledged Setsuna's prowess, suggesting the need for precautionary measures against him. As the fierce competition progressed, the second match commenced. He approached Layla, who was commending him for his performance, inquiring if he intended to watch the next match. He affirmed, hinting at seeking inspiration for his own tactics. Observing the current contenders, summoning versus formation. He listened as the host updated the audience on the summoning department's representative, Carol, gaining the upper hand, while the formation magic representative struggled to close the distance for an effective attack. Despite the formation department's representative being at a disadvantage, their attempts to overcome Carol's summoning tactics caught his eye, making him wonder if he could incorporate similar close-quarters combat strategies into his own arsenal. Layla tells him that movements from other magic paths are really cool, but she wants to get stronger at close combat magic. He asks her why she chose close combat magic when there were other paths, and she replies that she was once saved by a close combat mage a long time ago. She was playing with her little brother in the forest when they were attacked by a grizzly. At the time, she thought it was hopeless, but a close combat mage rushed in to help them. After that, it became her dream because she wants to help people around her and get stronger, too. She then shyly tells him that it was really childish to become a close combat mage because of it, but he replied that it wasn't childish at all. He tells her that as long as she has set a goal in her heart, she'll surely become stronger, making her shyly laugh in response. Leo then saw him and greeted him. He knew that Leo Elmcrest was the second strongest in the long-range department, after him. Leo tells him that he saw the first match and, even with close combat magic, he was really strong. He asks if the girl next to him is perhaps his. Leo then raises his pinky finger, making him ask Leo what he meant by the pinky finger, but then Layla shyly and loudly tells Leo that he was wrong because she was just Setsuna's friend. She then walks away while telling them that she'll leave them alone for a while, making him confused and ask what was wrong all of a sudden. He then tells Leo that he didn't expect that he wouldn't be the representative for the long-range department, and that if it were him, he should be able to defeat Actor. Leo tells him that it might sound like an excuse, but he should be careful of Actor's dirty moves because he was fooled by Actor and lost the representative spot to him. He replied that he understood and figured out that Actor is the type that will do anything just to win, and he knows that he can't let his guard down. Meanwhile, in some mansion, someone enters one of the rooms and Actor opens a chest with something inside. Actor then smirks creepily upon seeing it. Days later, the host announced to everyone that the first match of the second round was long range versus close combat, and the selected stage was the scorching hell, where falling means the end. Drago tells Lionel that with that stage, even approaching the opponent would be difficult, and Lionel responds that, again, it was a stage advantageous for their opponent. On the other hand, Actor tells Cyrus that it was expected from the head of the long-range department because that level of cheating is a piece of cake for him. Cyrus replies that he must thoroughly teach Setsuna a lesson and make Setsuna regret choosing close combat. Meanwhile, in Setsuna's room, he tells Layla not to touch the vase on his table, making her confused. 
He then explains to her that the vase is a contact-triggered magic tool and it'll completely suck up her mana. She was shocked upon hearing it and asked him why he had put something like that there. He sighingly replies that it was a trap aimed at him, and it makes it the seventh one. She was horrified upon hearing that it was the seventh one and asked him if he was alright with them. He replied that he had avoided dealing with them, so there was no problem, and he knew that the culprit was undoubtedly Actor because Actor was quite cunning and didn't even leave any evidence behind. Suddenly, someone knocked on the door, and the children happily gave them a bouquet of flowers. Layla called the girl in front, Ara, to ask her what the matter was, and the boy who was pointed to the side replied that a person over there asked him to give those to them. He looked in the direction the boy was pointing but didn't see someone. Layla asks the children if that person is Setsuna's fan when that person could have given the flowers himself. Ara coughed and breathed heavily while the boy, coughing, tells her that the person said he was embarrassed. Ara let go of the flower and, shakingly, told them that she felt a bit dizzy. He then saw a black spot on Ara's neck and remembered that he had seen those spots several times on the battlefield before his regression. He immediately kicked the flower away. Layla, who was hugging Ara, asked him what was wrong, and he replied that the flower was a poisonous grass called venenum. The boy started to shake and cough too, and suddenly, all the children were down on the floor in pain. He was furious that Actor dragged even children into it and that Actor was going to go that far. He tells Layla that if they don't treat the children quickly, it will become irreversible. But he knows that finding a healer right now who can deal with that poison won't be easy. She asked him if she was right that the children's condition was urgent to which he replied yes. He then told her that she should stay away because there was a chance that the poison could infect just by being near it. She frowned in fear but told him that it was okay while reaching into her pocket. She then showed him her brooch, explaining that it was a magic tool that stores mana. She explained that it had healing magic her mother had embedded for her. She used it to heal the children, and he saw the dark spot fading away from Ara's neck. She tells him that, though her mother gave it to her as a present for emergency purposes, surely this situation qualified. He tells her that he is grateful to her. He then grabs the flower and runs away at speed, shouting to her to leave the poisonous grass to him. He knows that venom grass is most toxic when it blooms, so he must dispose of it before it blooms. But if he does it in a crowded place, the toxins will end up scattering. He then runs out of the academy at speed, still holding the venomous flowers that are slowly blooming, and gets infected by it. He arrives in the forest where the sacred tree is, knowing that if he hopes to dispose of it, it is the perfect place. The venomous flower then blooms, and he throws it into the air. He creates a mana blade and furiously slashes the venomous flowers. They spread everywhere, but with the help of the sacred tree, the toxin doesn't scatter, and the venomous flower disappears before it lands on the ground. Meanwhile, in the arena, the audience is whispering, and one of the men asks his friend if the close combat representative is still not there, to which his friend replies that maybe Setsuna ran away. The host announces to everyone that as the designated time has arrived, player Setsuna would forfeit, and player actor would be declared the victor. But before the host could finish the announcement, he shouts to the host to wait, making Lionel and Drago surprised, but actor is the most shocked one when he sees him arrive while catching his breath. He then furiously shouts that he won't forfeit and shouts at Actor to fight him, but Actor just laughs at him and asks if he will fight with that messed up condition of his. They both walk to the stage, and Actor smirked, telling him that it looked like he had accepted the congratulatory gift for the first round from him. He asked Actor if this was his way of doing things and told him that unrelated kids were being affected by a deadly poison, but Actor acted as if he didn't know about it and asked if there was such a thing making him clench his fist in anger. Actor then told him that he was surprisingly passionate and that even the kids should be happy to be used by the elite, making him furiously call out Actor's name. The host then shouted to everyone that the second round begins, and Actor immediately attacked him with Storm Ballet, which he jumped to the side to avoid. Drago asked Lionel if there was anything wrong with Actor because Actor's mana was totally unrefined. He held his shoulder, knowing that with the protection of the sacred tree, the venom grass's poison was purified, but there wasn't enough to purify the poison inside his body. He then saw a swarm of magic powers heading toward him but managed to jump forward in time to avoid it. However, Actor, smiling, shouted not yet and continuously attacked him. He continuously jumped by the stones to avoid every attack of Actor while getting closer and closer to him. The host announced that the close combatant was completely on the defense, but Cyrus smiled, thinking that their preparation was worth it. Cyrus then told him that he better prepare himself for humiliation. But he just peeked at the audience side, noticing that Layla was still not back, and hoped that the kids were safe. Actor cast another spell while teasingly asking him if there was something he was worrying about, but he just caught his breath and kept silent. 
a student teasingly said that the close combat representative was just running away, and another man replied that he guessed they had no way of dealing with long-range opponents. Factor then launched more magic attacks while teasingly suggesting to him to consider withdrawing, but he just covered his body, deciding to defend with the mana guard. However, when Actor's magic power tip hit his mana guard, it shattered, and he was hopelessly hit by it. His blood dripped on the ground, and he was severely injured and poisoned. Actor laughed at him and shouted to him that he was really falling apart now, but he just glared at Actor and asked him why he wasn't finishing him off, making Actor confused. He told Actor that the best move would be to prevent close combat and then to overwhelm him with consecutive attacks, yet all he has been doing is provoking. He then asked Actor what he was planning. Actor tells him that he never expected to be lectured on long-range tactics. However, he acknowledges his good observation and admits that he was definitely not to be underestimated. Actor then shouted for him to look around, and he saw that there were no stones left to jump around him. The fireball man was shocked and asked when Actor had done it. Actor tells him that he adheres to the principle of avoiding unnecessary risks, and that it was his aim from the start. Actor then activated his storm cannon skill, making Drago and Lionel frown in panic and worry. Actor, holding the storm cannon, told him that with it, it was over for him. Suddenly, Layla called out to him from the audience's side and shouted that the kids were safe now, making him smile and use his physical boost, saying that he didn't have to worry about the children anymore. With his fully healed body, he tells Actor that it was his comeback, making Actor shocked and asking him how he has recovered. He created a mana blade while replying that it was not that surprising and explained to Actor that it was an application of physical boosts, and he had been activating his cells all along while fighting and breaking down the poison. He also tells Actor that when he was busy chipping away at the footing, he fell for the plan and called Actor a coward. Actor, stutteringly, tells him not to get cocky and asks him what he can even do in that situation. Cyrus shouted to Actor that he was right and ordered him to do it, which Actor followed and released his storm cannon in his direction. He faced the storm cannon, knowing that there was no footing and the remaining magical power was scarce, but he tells Actor that much should be enough for him. He then swung his mana blade at the storm cannon coming in his direction. He got slashes, but he tried all his might and managed to throw it back at Actor, making Actor shocked and Drago couldn't believe that he repelled it. Actor swung his hands forward and stopped his storm cannon before it hit him in time. Actor then asked him if he thought he couldn't nullify his own magic and told him that his strategies had run out, so it was over for him, but Actor was stunned when he appeared in front of him with his mana blade. He then asked Actor if he did not think he could leap that distance. Actor shakes in fear and disbelief and gets slashed with his mana blade. He then tells Actor, who has collapsed on the ground, that if he wants to seek forgiveness, he should do it from the children. The host then announced that the winner was Sitsuna Cromwell. Drago smiled in pride, and Lionel was finally able to light his cigar. But Drago was shocked when he noticed that the ground Sitsuna was standing on crumble into pieces. The students panicked and shouted that those two were falling while looking at him and Actor falling to the lava. While they were falling, he noticed that Actor was unconscious, which was bad. He immediately jumped to a stone behind him and grabbed Actor's leg before he could fall to the lava. He cursed in panic, but then someone called Fenrir and a beast caught him in time. He knew that it was Carol summoning magic, and the audience cheered when Fenrir successfully rescued them. The beast landed on safe ground, and Carol sweetly praised her beast for doing a good job while he was being treated. Carol looked at him and said that it seemed like he'd be fine even without her help, but he told her that she really rescued him. He knew that Carol of the summoning department was a contender for the championship and had both talent and style. He thought that if Carol kept winning like this, he better be prepared for a fierce battle. The students couldn't believe that the close combat representative won again, making them guess that it was not a fluke and thinking that if it continued like this, it would be absolutely unprecedented, while the headmaster was silently and interestedly watching him. On the other hand, Cyrus was fuming with anger and calling Actor a useless bastard. Cyrus then shouted to him that he would never forget this. A moment later, when he was changed and rested, Layla praised him, and Drago told him that he heard the situation from Layla. He asked Layla what happened to the children, and she replied that the children were sleeping in the infirmary for now and the doctor said they'd recover soon. He replied that he understood and it was a relief, but then he felt something dark and was stunned for a moment. He then looked back to check who it was, making Layla ask if there was something wrong and he replied no, but he wondered what that was just now because he felt that it was cold and it was ominous magic filled with killing intent. He also wondered what exactly was lurking in that tournament. Days later, he was in the forest, thinking that the final match was in a week and that a mysterious presence, a new power, was necessary to oppose it. He then heard someone approaching while he was busy thinking that the power he seeks was possessed by Lionel, who was asking him what was up and why he called him out there. 
He replied that he wanted to ask for his guidance again, calling Lionel Professor, but asked if he should call him Fist of Comet, making Lionel shocked. Lionel then said that it was quite a nostalgic name and asked where he heard it, making him realize that it was really Lionel. He remembered that Fist of Comet was a nickname he had heard in the Magic Corps before his regression, and Lionel was a close combat mage rumored to defeat even ferocious dragons with a single blow and had left the army by the time he joined, so they couldn't fight together. He had been thinking about it since they had been in contact. He then bowed to Lionel and begged him to teach him his magic. Lionel told him it had been a long time since he was called the Fist of Comet, and he replied that it was irrelevant because among all the close combatants he had encountered, Lionel was the strongest. Lionel asked him why he sought power to such an extent when he was already strong enough, but he replied that it was not enough and he didn't want to lose to anyone, even if the opponent was a god. Lionel stared at him in silence for a moment, but then smiled and laughingly told him that he was indeed interesting. Lionel then stretched his arm, agreeing to teach him and explaining that normally, it was not a technique he'd teach to a student whose body is still growing. Lionel then gathered his mana in his fist, and he noticed an immense amount of mana gathering on Lionel's fist. The ground around them cracked as Lionel gathered mana and explained that this magic was the origin of why he was called the Fist of Comet. It consumes too much mana, so he can't use it multiple times, but one shot is enough, and he should watch closely. He then covered his face when Lionel released his fist, which released a strong power. With the half-cigar in Lionel's mouth, he shattered a large expanse of ground without his fist even hitting it. He smiled in surprise to see such a strong power, and Lionel explained to him that the technique requires the constant gathering of mana and was not suitable for one-on-one -on -one battles like in a tournament. Lionel then asked him if it was still okay with him, to which he replied yes and told Lionel that he was counting on him. Lionel then agreed and told him to follow him because they would start training right away. Meanwhile, in Carol's mansion, a man congratulated her for making it to the finals, and she sweetly thanked the man. The man told her that her opponent was in close combat and asked her how confident she was. She replied that victory or defeat depends on luck, but she'd do her best to have a good match. She then asked the man if he would like another cup of tea, which the man agreed to and thanked her for. When she stood up holding the tray of tea, the man grabbed something from his pocket and took out a paper with an emblem. The man then pointed it behind her, making her feel pain as the emblem on the paper marked her nape. She then collapsed with the tray she was holding as the man stood up, saying that if she won, then so be it, and if the situation changed, then so would their plans. Well guys, that's the end of the video. If you like this video comment part 2 in the comment section. Also subscribe to the channel, hit the bell and like the video. Thank you for watching and see you next time again.